And we are here today. Um, this is going to be our Advocacy Day keynote address. I am Kelly Fast. I am the Director of Advocacy for the State of Missouri. And um, with me today, I have um, a distinguished Senator um, Holly Rader. And Senator Rader is going to talk to us a little bit about some of the things that go on in our government. Also, I have Veronica Richardson with me, um, and Veronica is our current um, president-elect for Missouri Health Information Management Association. So, um, Veronica, would you like to tell a little bit about yourself um, for our audience and for Senator Rader? Yeah, I'm Veronica Richardson, and like Kelly said, I'm on the Mohima Board of Directors currently. I'm the Director of Public Relations, and I am the incoming president-elect, and we'll take that post starting in July. So I am so excited to have the opportunity to meet with you, um, and we're, we're welcoming you as part of our event. Thank you so much. Um, I think our first question really is going to be if you could just describe um, your path and how you got to be where you are in your career. So, um, you know, it's uh, an interesting question and I love this question because I'm not um, maybe what I thought was traditional when it came to um, folks getting elected or running for office. I was not raised near politics at all. Um, I was actually raised on welfare and, um, you know, with just single parent home. My mama struggled with mental illness. Um, we just, you know, got by. And um, I didn't know who the president was. You know, it just wasn't something that came up in our household. But um, at 15, I had to drop out of school to help um, take care of my family. And um, I got married at 15, had my first baby at 16, realized I was headed down the wrong path, um, same that I had been raised. And so I changed things and um, raised my children in church and uh, worked, you know, multiple jobs and to get myself out of poverty, uh, took classes, college classes at night and on the weekends. And it took me 17 years to get my degree, but I got it and was, you know, I'm so proud of that. But, um, you know, I started in the mail room of a cable television company and worked my way up to being one of the top four directors in the company after 14 years. Um, so my background is, a, is quite a bit different than a lot that you find in elected office. Um, we have a lot of attorneys here. And um, a lot of people who have um, had uh, politicians in their family tree. And, um, but really none of that was the case with me. I, um, my husband and I had started our own business. I was working as director of government affairs for a cable company. Like I said, that I'd worked my way up. Um, and I started getting asked to come and speak on some bills from the cable association, some bills that would affect um, the business that I work for, but then also my personal business that my husband and I had started. And so as part of my job of director of government affairs, I was coming up to Jefferson City and speaking on some bills and I was just really surprised um, at how many attorneys we had up here. And not that we don't need attorneys, we absolutely need attorneys, but how many attorneys we had elected, I felt like we didn't have um, very many business owners. We didn't have um, people who I felt um, really had um, had those life experiences, you know, before being in, in office and voting on things that affect my bottom line, my business's bottom line, that affect the people who grew up like me, you know, so often our um, compassion overrides our common sense in government. And, um, and we end up, you know, with, with all these programs, we end up holding people from really ever reaching their potential. And so all of these things that I had witnessed firsthand, um, being in Jefferson City, working on some bills, I saw how we just needed people with more 
differences in their background um, with more experience, uh, more skin in the game. And so at that point, I talked to my husband and said, hey, I might want to run for office someday. And, you know, he was as surprised as I was. Um, but I started, um, you know, I'm very much a planner. And so we decided that once our children were old enough um, that I would run for office. And so to plan for that, I went to work uh, volunteering for our congresswoman. I wanted to see, I had seen the policy side of it as a constituent working up here. And, um, and I went to work for the Cable Association. And so that gave me more experience on the policy side. But then I started um, um, volunteering for our congresswoman and then went to work for our congresswoman because I wanted to make sure uh, from a candidate side, if that was something I, I truly wanted to do. Um, I'm not perfect, clearly, and uh, my children aren't perfect because they come from me. And so, um, <laughs> you know, I wanted to be sure it was something our family all agreed on. And, um, and so after a few years of that preparation, my uh, representative decided to run for Senate. And so that had her seat open. And so I ran for her seat. That's really interesting, and I, I applaud you uh, for seeing a need um, for um, having the courage, um, doing doing your homework. That's that's really right. <laughs> that you you know that you uh, kind of got a foot in the door there to to sort of check it out and uh, test out the yeah. waters, sort of. So um, that's really interesting. You know. One of the things that we really want to do with this session that we're that we're having um, is to uh, educate um, our membership about um, what goes on in government. Um, we study that in our education and our associate and bac baccalaureate level, but I think that it helps us um, kind of connect the dots when we can actually hear it from someone who's involved with it. So um, can you give us a broad view of how laws actually come to be and the process that happens um, on the Hill there in Jefferson City? Yes, and there's, there's a couple of different paths. And so one, you have the, um, what I call the traditional path, and that is where um, a business association, like say the um, NFIB or the Missouri Chamber notices something that's a problem or that needs fixed or, you know, like this year, for example, we had the COVID liability bill that we've been working on. So the chamber and, and these business groups saw that um, lawsuits were starting to get filed. And, um, and so they saw a need in advance that, hey, this is, is going to be a, a huge problem. Our businesses are gonna need protection our healthcare workers are going to need protection. Um, you know, from someone from, from the frivolous lawsuits of, hey, I, I was in the ER and they didn't have us distance six feet apart. You know, well, it's an emergency room. And you know, you've got <laughs> things happening. So we um, wanted, so that's one way we, that a, a need is found typically by an association, a group of attorneys or, you know, that is familiar with um, legislation. They work with legislation every day. And, um, and that's what they do. And so that bill was prepared and, and really worked through with the bill sponsor, who's also an attorney. Um, and so that's kind of your traditional path. Now, to me, your non-traditional path, equally as important, is when you have someone um, out in the trenches in one of these, you know, fields of work that say, hey, there's a need for this. And um, one of the things, uh, one of my bills this year is a perfect example of that. And it's um, blended uh, background checks for adults in blended classrooms. And so I had a shop teacher, a, a technical Votech teacher reach out to me and he said, Holly, I have adults coming onto campus during the day taking Votech classes with the high school students. Now, 
we are all for that and want um, more people getting the technical training. We are excited to have people from the communities into our, our high schools taking these classes, getting these certificates. But um, had he not have overheard this, he would not have known it, but a gentleman was sitting next to um, a couple of teenagers in class mentioned that he had uh, previously been in jail for making meth. So um, not that we want to exclude anyone from taking technical classes, but um, a background check is absolutely necessary. Certainly we don't want, you know, felons sitting next to a 16 year old, you know, befriending her and, or a pedophile or whatever, right? And so most cases there's opportunity for day or night classes. And, you know, there's other, other time frame opportunities. And so our bill um, that I worked through with my VOTEC teacher is that you have to have a background check if you are an adult applying to be in one of these blended classrooms on campus during your normal high school hours. Um, so it doesn't prevent them from being in, in any of the other VOTEC classes any other time, um, but just not sitting next to that 16 year old as an, an additional safety precaution. And it's just truly something that got missed because you know our volunteers, our lunchroom folks, I mean, they all have to have background checks, right? And so um, it completely makes sense, but this was something brought to me from a constituent who saw the need. So then um, you saw the need and then when did you, you present, present your bill at a certain time, I'm assuming? Right, um, so when session starts, we have session is January to May. Session starts um, th that first week in January. And then usually March 1st is the cutoff for filing bills. So I started working with legislative research. That's a, a group that we have. We have legislative research in the House and then legislative research in the Senate. And they help the senators and representatives draft language. They're a group of attorneys that that's what they do. They draft language for bills. So they're a group of attorneys that, you know, I took um, my concern to them and they drafted the language for me to look at. Me and my um, technical uh, VOTEC uh, teacher, you know, looked at it. And, um, and so then bill filing starts um, December 1. And so I had it pre-filed and ready to go. And so then um, it starts working its way through the process. So since I'm in the Senate now, it first um, had to be read in on the Senate floor. Then the leadership at that point uh, assigns it to a committee. Then you have to talk that committee chair into bringing your bill up to be heard because a lot of bills get assigned to all these committees. Mm -hmm. And um, so then your bill is heard and then you have your pros and your cons. In this case, um, so Shockingly enough, we had um, the Missouri State Highway Patrol had some issue with the way the language was drafted because the FBI had reached out to them and said they had issue with the way the language was drafted because it was, there's one background check system that isn't a state background check system. Anyway, so that helped us work through problems that we didn't know were there. So we got that bill amended in committee so then it got voted out of committee and now it's sitting on the calendar waiting to be heard in the Senate, on the Senate floor. Once it's heard on the Senate floor and voted out, then it'll go to the House and have to go through that same process of going to the House committee then to the House floor. However, you know, since we're three weeks until closing, what we have is we have a pretty uh, non-controversial item that really does need to pass. Um, not going to cost the state anything. 
So what we're doing in my office, my chief of staff is working on amendments to put that language that we have as a bill, to have it ready so that when other bills come through that are education related, I can um, attach it on as an amendment to those. Uh -huh. And so that's the, um, you know, once you start working through the process, there's thousands of bills filed every year. And so many times you have to um, attach your language to a bill that's moving. That, that's really fascinating. And um, I think uh, is a good example of, um, you know, how that, how that would happen. Um, I also like how you, uh, you know, gave us an example that, that maybe had kind of a, a, a difference um, than right. maybe other bills, other bills would. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the process of rulemaking? So we know also that um, there are what's called rules that come through on the Missouri Register. And can you tell us how that ends up being um, a statute that has to be followed? I am not 100% on the rulemaking. This is, I'm actually um, on a uh, joint committee, JCAR, that I've been added to this year. We've only had just one structural meeting. So I'm not as familiar with that process, but I know um, JCAR is a committee that has the jurisdiction to look over any rule that our departments pass down and um, to see if, they're, if they have the authority to do that. Because you know, the different departments um, make up a lot of the rules that they go by. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and you can have some rogue folks putting some stuff in place that really doesn't need to be put into place. And then at that point, it would go to JCAR for review. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then those senators and representatives that are on that joint committee review them and decide whether they need to be put into place or not. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but then you also have just your normal uh, statutory rules that come through on bills. Um, so it's it's different, but but you do have a lot of departments that um, I think overstep their bounds mm -hmm. and and put some things in place that shouldn't be put into place. Well, I, I the think Department of Revenue is a great example of that. <laughs> we've, we've been having some problems with them and. Um, and, and really making requirements for some of our uh, DMVs, uh, extra hurdles for our owners of the DMVs. And, you know, these are private businesses. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're, we're really having to uh, balance some of that out. But There's also a, a public comment period as well on some, some of those, correct? Yes. Yes. yes, yes. On the ones that the departments work on, they absolutely do. So what advice would you give to our membership um, as far as being um, aware and, and even involved um, professionally and as a citizen um, in government? You know, um, something that I wasn't aware of until I, um, you know, started asking to, till I started being asked to come up and speak on, um, those bills was how much of a voice we have as a citizen. And so your representatives and your senators all have different backgrounds. Mine is in cable television, you know, um, small business owner, cable television. And so, um, you know, I'm a mom, I'm a grandma. Um, yeah, I was a church Sunday school teacher for years, um, raised in church. You know, so I have a lot of things that are my wheelhouse, but there's more things that are not. And so I really rely on um, hearing from, say, my pharmacist when there's a pharmacy bill going through. Since there are thousands of bills filed, it's easy for things to get by me, to get by everyone. You know, I mean, we have 
um, car dealership owners, we have real estate agents, we have, you know, um, retired teachers, um, uh, doctors, nurses, we have people from all walks of life um, that are not, you know, none of us are knowledgeable 100%. And so we absolutely need our nurses, our doctors, our pharmacists to reach out and say, hey, this is how this is going to affect me. You know, perfect example is like, you know, if we have a bill coming through to um, do something to the advantage of um, the, the pharmacy, um, um, the PBMs, the pharmacy benefit managers, you know, I mean, that you can't just look at that and read it and think, okay, this is going to be great for pharmacy. Because the truth is, is that those big pharmacy benefit managers like the Express Scripts, a lot of times the things that are helpful and advantageous that they're fighting for actually harms our local small pharmacists. And so when I get a call from one of my pharmacists that says, hey, Holly, heard this is happening, you know, that turns me to it. And then I get to go check it out. Then I get to go talk to the sponsor of it and say, hey, did you realize this is going to hurt our local pharmacies? Because all of us as senators and representatives want our local businesses to flourish, want our, um, you know, medical facilities to flourish. And so it's, it's very important that we hear from those of you that are in the trenches telling us where the problems are, what bills we need to look out for, how a bill's going to affect you. Um, otherwise, we're not going to know. And a lot of times we get form letters where we'll get a hundred of the same letter, you know, because different, because it'll pop up on Facebook or whatever, you know, to sign here or whatever and we'll get and and those are helpful um you know because we can say well we got you know 50 constituents this past week that are for the prescription drug monitoring program and we got two that are against it you know so so they are helpful in numbers but what's even more helpful um so i'm not saying don't do those because those are helpful but what's even more helpful is a personal story. You know, email, say, look, this is, you know, this is how this affected my home. You know, I mean, that just really puts a face to an issue and it really does help move the needle. That's, uh, that's what we are, are um, all about this year. We've been tracking bills. We um, went through a lot of, of what was filed noticed what um, uh, had an impact um, on, on patients, um, on patient safety, um, and uh, got on board with some of that. So um, we're, we're moving the needle a little bit uh, for awareness, uh, for Good. health information management. So that's, that's been our focus this year. And, and I think um, legislators are going to hear a lot more from us um, in the coming years because um, we are we are feet on the ground now, and um, this is really one of our strategic. It's it's a focus uh, strategically for us, and so we're so very grateful for the information that you've been able to share with us. I I really um, am interested to know about Senate Bill sixty three, one of the ones that we've been. Uh, following. Um, I, and the thing that's interesting about it to me is that you started with this a long time ago. I mean, as, as bills go, I think, you know, to have it, um, you know, you've just been, you have persevered. Yeah, I'm relentless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For sure. Um, and, you know, this bill was filed way before I got here. We had people working on it for years before I ever got here too. And so it's, it's sad, but um, we've also really, I feel like we've really educated the public, um, certainly the Capitol on uh, the stigma of mental illness, the stigma of addiction and how, um, you know, addiction is a disease and some of our bodies, mine, um, 
handles these powerful painkillers much different than say my husband's. You know, I can take them for two or three days and then I have to wean off because my body has attached to it. Um, my husband can, you know, need a painkiller for a week after surgery and quit taking it and he's fine. Yeah, and I, so, I noticed your, um, your testimony. I, I listened to some of it um, in the Veterans Committee um, last week. Oh, yeah. And, and um, I, I thought that was really interesting. And um, one of the things as, as health information professionals as well is when there are um, these items that come up, um, that involve things like patient privacy um, and those concerns. Um, we want to make sure also that um, legislators understand that we are subject matter experts for right. um, digital uh, information, digital yes. healthcare information. And that's um, something that you have to, um, your license can be affected by not following guidelines. And so, you know, the thought of a practitioner going to school for eight years or, you know, all of these lengths of time and, and putting your life work into this job and then, you know, risking that for, you, you just don't do that. You're, you're, you take it of utmost serious and, yeah. you know, it's your livelihood. It's what you put right. your heart and soul into to be perfect at that yeah, yeah. and um and since you did listen to the committee hearing that's one more thing about how important it is to hear your voices because um as you notice you know we had four or five against and the information that they brought were things that you were probably sitting there wanting to rebut so badly as you were listening to that uh -huh. because you actually are the professional that has the knowledge on that. And so to have um, folks with your training and um, your understanding and knowledge on all of this to actually sift through and be able to tell your legislator, look, this is the argument that I heard them make, um, but this is how the, this is what it, it truly is. Um, that's invaluable. Yeah, it's it's time for us to activate. I'll put it that yes, way. Yes, <laughs> yes. So we are so grateful again. Um, we've got a, um, a a half hour here, and and it's just flown by. And I I'm so grateful to you, and I don't want it to has. take up any more of your time. No, I but, appreciate um, you guys so much. Yeah, really, really uh, have appreciated uh, being able to talk with you today, and. Uh, hope that we can carry on conversation conversations again very soon. Me too. And you know, Senate Bill uh, 63 is still out there, still needs a lot of pushing. Um, it goes to the Rules Committee next, and we're praying that we've got enough votes to get it out of rules. And then it has a pretty big hurdle to get over on the House floor. So activating your members on um, the the their state representatives right now to let them know how important this is and just why and you know what what the truth is when it comes to uh, the health information systems and and how that is protected is um, hugely important for them to know right now. All right. Well, you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank y'all so much. Y'all too. Thank you. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.